My name is Dr Stuart Jackson. I'm from the Department of Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney. Uh, I'm a researcher there. Actually, my role is actually mostly as a teacher. I do a lot of lectures, a lot of lecturing, um, and run a lot of tutorials, uh, mostly, as I say, because my job is as a teaching-focused researcher. Um, but I do have the opportunity of doing uh, a certain amount of research in my chosen field, uh, which is on political parties. And uh, the topic will be party development in the Asia-Pacific. So I had 26 years in the party, uh, which is a, a long time, 25, 26 years, quarter of a century, as a party member, as a party activist, as a not party office holder. Well, 10 years at a state level, provincial level, and at a national level. So I ha actually have experience myself of being on the inside of a political party. I was also employed by the party at various times as a campaign manager. I ran election campaigns at a state level in particular in my home state of Western Australia, but also in my newfound state from 14 years ago uh, of New South Wales in Sydney. So I ran election campaigns at a local level, but also at a state level. I was an electorate officer and a research officer. And lastly, as I said, I worked five years as an organiser for the party. That is, I actually worked to build uh, the uh, New South Wales Green Party um, for five years, uh, developing the branches, making sure that they had adequate training. So I used to run training programs for them. I have also published on street protest, um, feminism and leadership, um, party structures and party development. Um, and party structures and party development are part of an ongoing interest I have actually in how party, political parties operate. Um, so as I say, my, key, my uh, key area has been domestic politics, but I understand how domestic politics can affect international relations. What I wanted to look at was, can you take an accepted, and I put Western Industrial Northern concept of party development or party families. Um, we know a lot about Western parties, political parties. We know a lot from a lot of research. There's a big body of research on political party development, particularly in Europe, um, but also the United States, Australia, a certain extent New Zealand. So those Western, industrial and northern nations. Green and environmental parties I chose, one, I know them, but two, they have a very explicit ideological um, base or set of principles. So they have a very clear idea of what they are doing and why they are engaged. So they're quite useful to see. Can you take a very Western European idea about what is green and can you then apply that in another country outside of that Western context? You know, can you apply it in... I could have done this in Africa, but I don't live in Africa. So we'll do it in the Asia-Pacific because Australia is in the Asia-Pacific. The Asia-Pacific itself, very diverse whether we're talking North Asia, whether we're talking Southeast Asia, whether we're talking South Asia, or the Pacific Islands themselves. So a very, very diverse uh, set of countries, a good mix of um, well, mixed development, mixed in industrialisation, certainly when we took to, to North Asia, and different levels of democratisation, different ideas about what is a, a functioning democracy. And what I wanted to look for, of course, was are there special factors cultural, social, economic factors that perhaps mean that an ideology like a green ideology can't just be taken and plonked down. Green parties have a, a global green organisation and they say you have to ascribe to these particular ideas. Yet what if those ideas can't just be applied to another country? Does that party of families allow for an adaptation, an expansion of those ideas to suit the political and social context that new parties develop in. Nonetheless, that's certainly where I've started from in terms of researching now into the Asia-Pacific, in terms of Green Party development, uh, the current status of Green Party development, but also future trajectories. Why is it important? It's important because, as I said, Green Parties are a global movement. They perceive themselves as a global uh, family of parties. Uh, they exist strongly in Europe. 
Um, they also exist in North America. They have members of parliament, certainly in the Canadian federal parliament, but also in states in Canada and certainly at the local level in the United States. They've been in government in Mexico, uh, in Brazil, um, or certainly engaged in government, but also have been involved in parliaments in Chile, Colombia, and a number of other South American countries. They have been engaged in Australian politics for, well, certainly had a member of parliament going back 26, 26 years now uh, in the Australian parliament. So they have a long history in Australian parliaments. The Global Greens counts the Asia Pacific as stretching from really uh, Samoa Tonga from the far or right in the centre of the Pacific all the way to Lebanon. So that's half the world, it seems, is encompassed, encompassed by uh, the Asia Pacific at its largest, most, ex well, largest extent, widest extent. Green parties have been successful primarily, though, in the West, in Europe. Uh, some success in Australia, but Australia still is part of the West. It's a northern industrial Western country. <coughs> Represented in most parliaments in Europe, but as I say, also into the Americas. It's largely unrepresented in Africa and the Asia Pacific. Australia and New Zealand aside, colonised by the British 230 years ago, um, Australia and New Zealand remain an exception. As if you like a Western island in an Asia Pacific region. So, Green Party is largely unrepresented. There are Green Parties in existence. They exist in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Mongolia. There are Green Parties across the Asia Pacific. Um, but they are not generally represented in parliaments. Australia, New Zealand, um, Vanuatu uh, aside, there are no parliamentary representatives for Green Parties. I go, aha, successful in Europe, South America, Canada, Australasia, Australia, New Zealand, but not in Asia. Why? So we can look at how parties are structured, a very Eurocentric, though it's very European-based idea of how parties are organised. We can talk about cadre parties and mass parties and catch-all, electoral professional. That's really about their organisational structure. But it's based on conceptions, ideas of what a party looks like in Europe or perhaps North America and not necessarily anywhere else. They represent particular what we call social cleavages, particular divisions within society, ethnicity, religion, class. So you have classically divided countries like Belgium, which is divided between those who speak Flemish and those who speak Walloon. So a language divide within one country. And it divides the politics very clearly. You have countries that are divided by religion. Northern Ireland being one of the, one of the classics between two forms of Christian. But certainly those were the major cleavage divides within those societies. But where am I looking? To Europe still. And class. We all know about the ruling class, upper class, middle class and workers. But the usual division is between you know, a working class party, a workers party, a labour party, a middle class party which might be liberal in orientation. It's the classical liberal in or orientation. And a, a ruling class party which will be conservative generally. Not always, but generally. And those are those sorts of classic sorts of divisions. And then we can say, oh, well, there's the ideologies that divide parties. Marxist, Green, social... And we know the ideologies. You will have come across them in parties that you will have read about. Christian, Democratic, Conservative, Liberal, Social Democratic, Green, Marxist. Again, all European ways of thinking about divisions within society and divisions within parties. Some of these, yes, certainly in terms of social cleavages we can apply outside of Europe. But a lot of the, other, a lot of the writing about this has been very Eurocentric, very European-focused. The research literature on Asian parties, there's a lot of different mixes here. Some are based on ideology. So, so there have been Marxist parties. We'll know about the various communist parties. So on those normal ideological bases. But then there's a mixture of... Nationalist parties, parties that exist around an idea of a nation. So 
the idea of an Indonesian nation or a Filipino nation or a Thai nation, something that binds and holds different ideas or the ideas of nation or country together. Also capitalism, you know, how best to be a business party. And you have to look to Thai Rak Thai in Thailand to think of a business-based party. So ones that are looking very closely at, well, it's only about business and politics exists to facilitate, to make it easier for business to operate. Certainly, when most of the writing about parties was occurring in the 50s, 60s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and even into the 1980s, there was less of a wealth gap. Um, in European parties, certainly amongst electors, there was less of a gap between most people's wealth. You had a middle class and a working class, but there was not a huge disparity. There wasn't huge numbers of very poor people, and there were very small numbers of very wealthy people. Certainly in terms of uh, the research literature, we see there's always been across Asia, but this also applies to Africa, a small wealthy elite and a large mass of far less wealthy people. Now with a large middle class emerging, this large middle class should be providing the impetus for people looking for new parties and new political organisational forms. New parties, basically. And of course there are major development issues across the region. So this is telling us something about the political structure that operates within each nation and why the Asia-Pacific is not Europe, and just taking a European notion of what a party is and how a party might be structured and dropping it on, on Asia would be a mistake. And while we then need to go back and say, all right, how do they structure themselves? How do they look? The low levels of democratic knowledge. When people are concerned about developing themselves, uh, they certainly in terms of material levels... Uh, they will look for developing that any way they can. What is required for a democracy? I tell my students normally, you know, what do you need for, or I ask them, what do you need for a democracy? Most people say, oh, to have a vote. But actually a democracy takes much more than just having a vote. So perhaps it's more than just having a vote. Perhaps it's the institutions that exist. The courts and the parliaments and the public sector, the public service how they operate, and those various institutions of a democracy and how important they are for maintaining and developing um, a, a multi-party democracy in a nation. Thank you, Stuart. Actually, I have ten questions, but I summarize <laughs> it and make it more concise, so it become one question. In Australia, it is very common uh, for the last seven years, uh, Australia... Prime Minister in Australia changed very often. Yep. But uh, interestingly, there's no riot there. No. If in Indonesia it happened, I think it will, it, it will be more susceptible to the political and economic uh, stability. Mm. Why it happened in Australia and why it's different in Indonesia? Ah. Thank uh, you. We, ha we have. <coughs> There are two different systems. Right? To begin with, there are two different institutional systems. Indonesia has a presidential system. Right? Australia has a parliamentary system, Westminster <laughs> parliamentary system. It's based on Australia being a, a colony, or former, six former colonies that got together in 1900 to form one nation. So the Prime Minister is elected by the Parliament. It happens to be from the... Um, the largest party. And because we have single-member electorates, single-member electorates, uh, you know, elect one person for one district, tends, to, uh, tends towards a two-party system. Right? Um, that's Diverger's law theory, everyone. Diverger's law states that uh, a majoritarian system will tend towards a two-party system. So in our House of Representatives, we, we actually have three large parties, a, a rural party, the National Party, um, and because Australia had a long history of agricultural production, that party remained quite strong. Uh, Labor Party, Social Democratic Party, and the Liberal Party, which is a conservative party. Uh, and they generally the contests are between Labor and Liberal or Labor and National. 
The Greens are shaking that a little bit just in the inner city, but that's really the structure of Australian politics. So generally, the Liberal and National Party form a coalition. So you really have two sides then. You're down to two parties, Liberal National Coalition and Labor Party. They will control the House of Representatives. Therefore, whoever they put up is the Prime Minister because Parliament elects the Prime Minister. So a different system. When you look to the first 10 years after Federation, so 1900 to 1910, 1911, uh, Prime Ministers lasted mm. six months, a year. I think one lasted two and a half years, two years, nine months, actually. Um, there was quite a fast change. In the colonial period before then, you know, the, the chief minister would change relatively quickly because it was elected by parliament. And you look to English parliaments, and actually you see the same thing used to happen many years ago. So the prime minister appears to be a president, but actually they're only the parliamentary or the leader of the, the largest parliamentary party. Um, whereas you have a presidential system, like in the United States, but also like France, a number of other countries, the president has a large amount of power. Right? For the president to be overthrown, it would have to be something quite dramatic, military coup or something similar, or corruption impeachment. Um, so it would have to be actually significant to actually get rid of the president. Um, so, and the, the parliament is separate. Right? So the, the two different systems affect how you can change your leader. There is, in the back of my mind at the very least, this much larger process about the party development and about the processes of party development and the barriers to parties developing. What does it tell us about the processes of or the barriers to democratisation in the Asia-Pacific, but one could argue democratisation more broadly? And can we learn something from looking at parties in the Asia-Pacific? I hope so. <laughs> but that's my, the bigger question that sits in the back of my mind. To understand a research process, we decided to start interviewing people, to going and ask them, why are you involved in a party? What's stopping your party developing? What do you need to make a political party? All the usual answers about, oh, well, we don't have any money. You know? I said, yes, this is true. Resources. We questioned them about the barriers. Political violence is still a problem in many countries. So even for a tiny party running in one seat, there was a political violence problem. I mentioned resource constraints, which is financial generally. People don't have the money you need to run a political party, to run a campaign that is effective. Registration barriers. For instance, if you wish to register a, a party here in Indonesia, you must have a branch uh, in each of the provinces, every province and in every city. And you go down and down. I, I worked out that if you had just one member in each branch, you would have three and a half thousand members. And you go, that's a high registration barrier. Not in terms of the numbers, but you have to be across the whole country. In part because the ideas of parties are tied to a national idea. Uh, you have to have a national party because there's a national project in operation. And if you allow little parties everywhere, then perhaps the country itself would pull apart. So it's about holding a country together. Political corruption, not necessarily endemic. Uh, that is, not necessarily in every country. But certainly it appears in certainly, again, um, uh, uh, people from uh, Nepal said, yes, there is corruption here. Yes, it is difficult. If you don't pay the right people, your papers might not get filed or they get lost or something goes wrong. People will utilise your name steal your name, or you know, there's a lot of lying about who is, or what their policies are. And that lack of knowledge about democracy or democratic institutions. For Greens, there's one other. People go, what are the Greens? You know, I know about the major parties. I know about the big parties. So you actually have to educate people about why the environment might be a good thing. That tends to mean that the Greens are locked into the middle class. Yet it does not have to be. So what do we need a party for this for? I said, well, there are other ideas encapsulated within a green ideology. So I moved on from barriers. We looked at barriers. We moved to particular countries. I chose Philippines, Indonesia, and Japan, three countries that actually have 
Green parties at various levels. They have different issues that are actually linked to, um, well, political structures mostly. So, registration barriers, financial barriers. There are institutional constraints in terms of the structure of the presidency. So, they have these very particular um, issues in terms of their party development. So, look at the island nations, Fiji, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, but also to look at PNG, Papua New Guinea, include French Polynesia, Tahiti. We will look, that's my next focus, is to work on uh, understanding where there are parties. Do they exist? I know they exist in a very small way in a couple of them. Some of the, po some of the politics of the countries is such that you can't have parties. Some of the countries say there are no political parties. You can only run as an independent. So there's no possibility there. But are some of the people who are run as independents, are they perhaps environmentally minded? Not for a Green Party, but perhaps they're interested in the environment. Are they people that a Green Party might want to talk to? Just to say, ah, you're interested in environmental issues. Can we talk to you, contact you? Can we establish links? I wanted to look at the legislative, cultural and economic basis for such a party. Is there an actual base in these countries? Perhaps the Vanuatu Green Federation shows that there might be. And it has three, well, now has two members of parliament, did have three members. Uh, they have shown that they can get elected, election after election. But what about all the other nations? What about all the other islands? Solomon Islands is still coming out of uh, a very violent civil war. So, or internecine, inter-tribal warfare. Um, is there a possibility there? There are people who want to form a Green Party there. So, oh, okay. Well, I will go and talk to them and find out. We don't know what the barriers will be for most of those islands. No one's done a comprehensive survey of all those particular islands to find out. You know, is there a possibility for a Green Party? Why would there be a Green Party? Are the issues the same? Are the political structures the same? Well, we know they're not. Well, OK, how are they different? Is it important? Does it affect the process of democratisation? How do parties form, etc.? I can go on and on, but there's, I think, quite a bit of work in there. But that's the next step, the next bit to look at. What I want to look to is identify emergent green and environmental parties, identify the level of development. There was a person developing a green party in Fiji prior to the last um, coup in 2005. Uh, that would have registered um, and run in the next election, except that there was no election. There was a coup, elections were cancelled. And then they introduced their new laws, so their last election was really between a very small number of parties, because they're the only ones who had 5,000 members. So is it possible to stand you know, at different levels? Whether they have representatives, what policies they've developed. I also want to look at policy development, whether it aligns um, with other Green parties, so do they have similar policies, or have they taken very different roads? So I would expect that Greens, with a very clear, formal ideology, would allow adaptation. That's what I expect to find. Uh, that's what I hope to find. I think it's important for the Green parties that they allow adaptation and don't become formulaic. Uh, this, is, this is what your party must look like because then they become like the old Communist Party which became very formulaic. Are those ideas transferable? Key element. Can we take Western Northern ideas and transfer them? Nationalist ideologies, does the nation or the ideal of the nation trump everything else? Are Green parties just a middle class phenomena? Do they just exist for the middle classes? Do people who struggle materially, those who are looking to keep their job, to find a job, to keep their house together, are they actually concerned about green issues? And as I say, climate change. Well, even though um, I, think all, I think all of us would understand that issues like climate change are political, but what, do, what does everybody else, what does people out there think? Do they see it as political? If they don't see it as political, and you have a party based on that as a political idea, well, then they're not going to connect with you. They're going to say no. Last one, adaptation is the issue for most people. How do we protect ourselves from climate change? Not how do we cut down our carbon footprint, not how do we change the politics, but how do we adapt to the changing world? Party development may not be important for democratisation. 
parties as we would understand them, certainly in a European context, have only existed now for 120 years. The idea of the mass party develops in the 1890s. It does raise the problem of personality politics, cartel-like behaviour. That is, a group of parties acting to exclude everyone else and to feed off the state. And they build themselves up, exclude everybody else, embed themselves within the state. And indeed, it doesn't matter whether they're in government or not in government. Who's in government? Because they're all doing well. But only that group of parties. That raises the question of, well, is that a democracy? Hmm. A couple of other things that I'm doing. I'm doing a membership survey. That is an online survey of members of the Greens Japan. It's the first one that I know of of anyone doing a form of surveying, certainly of a Green Party, but potentially of other parties. Um, certainly <coughs> Australia has not had high levels of surveying of uh, parties. Uh, I'm reasonably sure that it doesn't exist in most of Asia. I could be wrong, but I've not found it. I've not read it. I've not seen it. And, of course, using it online. It's cheaper. I'm a researcher. Researchers don't have lots of money unless you've you know, won a golden prize from... Uh, Australian Research Council or Research Council. Otherwise, you just have to do what you can. I also, as I say, do ecofeminism and leadership. Uh, I do that because ecofeminism was seen as very important, combining a, a particular feminist approach to patriarchy, but also environmental. And they're saying, ah, the same drivers of why women are oppressed by men also drive why people oppress or exploit the environment. Well, that's the ecofeminist argument. They don't have necessarily a coherent idea of what leadership is in this context. I actually teach a unit as part of the Master of Public Policy um, called Leadership in Theory and Action, which goes through all the different ways we can think of leadership. I don't teach people to be leaders. I teach people to think about what is a leader and how do we think about leadership. And is it possible to have decentralised or network leadership structures? As opposed to a single leader, perhaps you can have many leaders. And how does that operate? Um, certainly it was a very strong influence upon uh, green development, green party development, so it links in with my previous research. Street protest, I'm still doing street protest. It's particularly interesting for me because we discovered as we were going through that we could identify anti-system and anti-government protests. That is, people who are protesting about the whole system. I said democracy doesn't work or parties don't work, we need to change it. Occupy is the classic for anti-system, the system is not working. To anti-government, we hate this government, this government's doing bad things. So very clear differences between the two. We also noticed uh, the colonisation of these movements by Green Party supporters. Well, it looks like that's what the thing is. Perhaps they're the same. Uh, and that will be our next step, is to go further with this. Continuing on my protest research, continuing to look and track the progress of those Asia-Pacific Greens. Because there, there's a very different idea about how to develop the party. There, they've taken it to a different step, where they go, ah, we will get someone high-profile, someone famous, and they will be our lead candidate for president. And when we have the elections, that will lift our vote up. But what normally happens is that person then leaves... You know, they don't get elected, perhaps they do very well. They'll leave to find a party, a vehicle, for them to get themselves elected. And then the party vote goes down again. And the party goes up, the party goes down. So it's a very different phenomenon to what's occurred in Europe, which, as I say, has been much more ideologically driven as opposed to personality driven. So that one's to look at that as a different way of thinking about perhaps how a party develops and uses leadership or particular leadership structures to develop.